Okay, folks, welcome to the latest installment of Let's Fix ISOM number two. Eh, screw it. You know, when I was uh, reviewing ISOM number one, when I was all said and done, I came to the conclusion that ISOM number one was a decent book with interesting characters, a compelling plot, and a good story structure. However, it was hobbled by too many small errors that when you took all those errors together, it made for a painful reading experience. I mean, it was like every other page, it was like, ugh, nothing thing wrong. Ugh, there's an art error. Ugh, there's a writing error. Oh, there's a coloring error. Oh, there's a lettering error. And it was just painful to get through the book. Well, once Eric July had received feedback, both from me and from other people, whether they were well-meaning or not, I was hoping that ISOM number two would end up being, on account of our efforts, a cleaner and more enjoyable read. That did not happen. ISOM number two is fucking garbage. I, I am only two-thirds of the way through the book, but this book is garbage. I can just declare it now. The quality control has only gotten worse. Not only do you have the same errors that showed up in ISOM number one, you actually have errors that he avoided in ISOM number one show up in this book. The characters, which were interesting before, are not interesting anymore. And even the new characters that he introduces are like really, really dry and tepid, and they all seem to speak with the same voice. They do not have distinct voices among them. It's like all of these characters sound the same. Moreover, and this is one of the most egregious things, is there's so much obnoxious fan service, product placement, and springboarding. He is using ISOM number two to sell other books. He's, he's not only just throwing things in there that make no sense to the story, but appeal to the fans who have demanded certain things from him, uh, and he's also dropped in scenes that are supposed to launch new characters and new interests and, and furthermore, are supposed to sell his upcoming books. And if you can do that in a way that actually enhances the story rather than slow it down, then that's okay. But he did not accomplish that. He threw in some seriously low-quality product placement that just drags the story down. So, in the spirit of one of my uh, ISOM number one videos, which was a rapid-fire volley of errors, I mean, this was the point at which I was basically saying, okay, I, I kind of give up on this book. Uh, I'd like to say that it's a good book, but there's just too many uh, errors in there, and I'm going to show you those errors, and I would go through and say, here's a writing error, an art error, a lettering error, a coloring error, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. I'm going to go through and do the same thing with ISOM number two for the second third of the book. First third of the book, I think I covered in great detail in my first six or so videos. This is going to be kind of a rapid fire excursion through the second third of the book. So the first problem is that the dialogue is very, very often vague and weak. Vague in the sense that he keeps using pronouns to refer to people who he should actually be talking about by name. Uh, like, for example, in the office scene with Darren, there's a goon who says, he's here. Well, who's he? Well, Santuan walks in the door, except Santuan's name is never mentioned in this scene nor in any of the recaps. So if you are a reader who is reading ISOM number two and you have never read ISOM number one, you have no idea who this guy is. He is an unidentified character throughout this scene and probably for the rest of the book. And that's just pathetic, as is the fact that Darren Fontano's last name has yet to be mentioned in an ISOM book by this point. He's your main villain. You've never given his last name. Sad. Now, Darren, uh, it, while thumbing it back at the guy holding the special gun supposedly capable of uh, taking out Santuan, when he says, now tell me everything you know about him, He's not actually meaning the guy who's in the picture. He's talking about Avery Silman. Because Santuan fought Avery Silman in ISOM number one, which would be known only to people who read ISOM number one. 
if you have not read ISOM number one, you have no idea who Darren's talking about because why would you? you you've never seen San Juan interact with Avery in any way whatsoever. So this is entirely too vague. There should be some explanation of what Darren wants and why he thinks San Juan should be able to give it to him. Now, in response to Darren's question, San Juan inexplicably says, well, you're not paying me for intel, F that. And Darren says, is he like you? And San Juan says, I don't know what you mean by that. I don't know what you mean by that. That's such an obvious lie. I mean, why does he even say it? Even Darren knows damn well that San Juan understands what he's saying. Darren is asking him, is Avery an except like you? Except being the term for a superhuman in this universe. Is Avery an except like you? To which San Juan should have responded, ain't nobody like me. Why? Because Eric July would remember from writing the character in ISOM number one, San Juan hates being generalized. He hates being called an except, and he hates being lumped into the same category as people like Avery. He, San Juan sees himself as one of a kind. He should not be you know, judged or diluted by being grouped together but with other superhumans. He feels himself yeah, I'm tempted to say a special snowflake, but in any case, a unique individual who should be considered unique and special on his own. So when Darren asks him, is he like you, that should have set San Juan off and not just sent him, send him cowering into feigned ignorance. Good Lord, know your own characters. So Darren says, huh, get out. This contract is done and good luck finding any work that's even remotely comparable. That's even remotely comparable? Are, are you telling me that Darren, the shot caller of Floor Spark, he can't even keep San Juan from getting a job? He, he's not even powerful enough to get San Juan canceled in Floor Spark. Oh my God, how pathetic is that? How, how weak does that make Darren look? And even worse still, you have the guy questioning him saying, you don't think that was a bit of an overreaction, boss? He's like, shut up before I fire you too. Oh my God. <laughs> Darren sounds like every weak clownish boss in villain trope history, all the way back to like Lex Luthor in Superman, the first movie. Oh God, where he had that, where he had Ned Beatty, you know, following around and he just, he just looked like an idiot. So, you know, Darren's your primary villain. Why would you ever make him look like a joke? Because at this point, that's all he is. He's a joke. Now, as a bonus, I've included how this scene should have gone. And you know, I kind of wanted to resist doing this, but I, I have a hard time resisting when I see how clearly a scene should have gone. And it's just so easy. So Darren asks Santuan in a very disrespectful manner if Avery is an except like him. San Juan goes ballistic at being subjected to the label except and generalized to being like Avery. San Juan throws Darren's men off of him, you know, because he's basically attacking Darren. And then Darren shoots San Juan in the leg with the special gun, hobbling San Juan and demonstrating his own superior superiority over San Juan and possibly over Avery too. So this would give us reason to fear for Avery's sake when Darren and he square off again, inevitably, okay? You know, that's how you make a character scary. You show that the hero actually has reason to worry about that character. Oh my gosh. Now we're, exp <laughs> oh God. Now we're going to the category, what the fuck are we even doing here? Now, first I apply that to the three-page alpha core scene that was thrown in the middle of the uh, Gooder, Gooding Firefighter experience. Now, this was thrown in there so that Eric July wouldn't have to go through the process of writing Gooding fighting the fire. Uh, instead, we get three pages of what is basically product placement. 
and this, all this is doing is trying to sell Alpha Core number one and the IRA number one. It doesn't give you any new information except for a couple of slivers of things here and there. And honestly, this is one of the most boring three-page sets in the whole book. But we're not done with boring, useless trash because we're about to experience the Southern Style Wrestling League. So we come to an uh, Obertonic Arena where wrestling is going to be going on. And you've got two wrestling announcers, Terry and Joanny Parker. Is that, is that Joanny? Joni? Did someone misspell Johnny? I mean, it's the Ripperverse. You, you, you can never know if somebody just made a fucking mistake. So, um, I'm going with Joni, because that's, that's the only thing I can think of that actually might make any sense. Uh, so you've got Joni and Terry, and they are the announcers, and as they are talking about how the title changed hands the night before, uh, all of a sudden they're interrupted by a clank, 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 which apparently is a sound effect they weren't expecting to hear. It's a sound effect uh, announcing the advent of one Larry Shugnight, and I remember looking at this picture and thinking to myself, what is supposed to be making that clanking noise? Because I don't, I don't see anything offhand, and it was only after a while that I realized that those hammer and anvil things up at the top represented the clanking noise, which are not that easy to see if you've got fucking hands blocking them. So, so thanks, Cliff. You know, try and figure out what's actually important in a scene. Don't just, you know, draw the first thing that comes into your mind. Moreover, if we're introducing Larry Shungite. Maybe we should have Larry Shungite on the fucking page? I, is that too much to ask? I mean, holy shit. I know, I know that in pro wrestling, you play a little bit of the stuff, and then, you, uh, you, then the guy comes out. But my God, you just dedicated a whole fucking splash page to a no-show so far. And then when he actually comes out, it's just a little tiny paddle. So I'm not, I'm not impressed by this at all. At all. So Larry Shungite comes out, and somebody in the crowd actually has Shungite Ain't Metal on a sign. Now, this apparently is not a fan of Larry Shungite, because to be called metal is actually a compliment. You know, you're tough, you're strong, you're fast, you're... There, there's good qualities associating with being called metal. So to say Shungite ain't metal, that's actually an insult, and I, I hope that's understood by everyone. Um, it's also factually incorrect, though, because it turns out, if you look it up, Shungite is a metal. And just in case you want to make sure that it is a, a metal that is associated with the strength and determination of pro wrestlers, nope. Total fucking nope. It is used in healing crystals. <laughs> what the absolute fuck? It's used in healing crystals, okay? This hippy-dippy trippy bullshit is now associated with your pro wrestling character. <laughs> I mean, look at the shamansisters.com description. Shungite is the stone of superpowers and alchemy. It's a Incredible healing and protection properties include purifying the body, boosting energy and immune system health, and balancing the mind. Oh my god, it's like you just you just brought in Larry Shungite and it turns out he's Marianne Williamson, the hippy dippy democratic candidate spiritual leader who tried <laughs> who didn't even score a point in the primaries. Oh my god. <laughs> I call it Larry Ann Williamson. Uh, Larry Ann Williamson, please come to the stage for your wrestling match and healing session. Oh, my Lord. So Larry Shungite comes to the stage, and he uh, takes the microphone, and because the dialogue's small in that scene, I'll, I've reprinted it for you, saying, How about you bring your punk ass out here and tell the great people of Floor Spark exactly why I'm no longer champion? And, of course, because we can't have a single sentence in ISOM number two go without a fucking error of some kind, that should be a question mark at the end. Now, Terry says, uh-oh, he's gone rogue. And suddenly, I'm actually kind of interested now. I'm actually kind of excited. Because I'm thinking to myself, oh, he's calling out the guy who beat him last night. I wonder who that is. 
I wonder who it is that we're going to see walk out of there because because you know this is going to be a face off of some sort and apparently you know Larry Shungite's gone off script so this is a big controversial thing we're about to see a major face off this is going to be exciting I wonder who the guy is so I turn the page and we just made a scene change what the absolute fuck were we doing in that five-page scene in the first place other than wasting goddamn time? Well, you don't have to tell me. I know exactly what happened. Some of Eric's derpy cupcake-eating fans demanded to see some of the Southern-style wrestling league, and instead of being a fucking writer, Eric said, oh, I'll cater to the fans. I'll throw in a five-page waste-of-time scene of fan service and just totally rip out the momentum of my book so that, you know, these people can have their little, you know, masturbation session to pro wrestling. Holy fucking shit. You know, a real writer, which Eric July is not at this point, says, is this going to positively impact my book? Not my sales, my book. Is this going to positively impact my book? And if so, I'll leave it in. But if not, I'm going to have to tell my customers, you know, I'll do it for you at some point, but now is not the time. It is so freaking important to understand that customer demand is not the be-all and end-all of what should be in your book, okay? What helps the story is what should be in your book. Figure out what advances the story, what communicates things better, what doesn't get in your way. Put that in your book. Don't put a three-page ad for AlphaCore and Yaira in your book. Don't put a five-page ad for the Southern Style West Wrestling League in your book. That's bullshit. You know, be a goddamn writer if you're gonna if you're gonna write this. Now let's get into the category of one-off mistakes, and these are just the you know pew pew kind of things that happen that just basically stab you in the eye practically every time you turn the page. So, for example, we have this meeting between Lincoln Eusebio and some contractor named Sally. And we notice that Lincoln's hair is now brown instead of gray. <sighs> Contacting Gabe Altaib. Why didn't somebody contact Gabe Altaib and get him to fix this? Would, would, would that have been so hard? But more importantly, we have uh, Smithers over there suddenly taking over Lincoln Eusebio's dialogue. Hmm. And she's only really talking to Lincoln in this scene, so why is the dialogue arrow pointing to Smithers here? Um, no, it should be pointing to Lincoln Eusebio, because he is the one actually talking in this scene. Nobody fucking edited this book. Okay, now here's one that uh, Eric July actually copped to, uh, where Avery is saying in his thoughts, a problem for you. A window of opportunity for them except the word you has been accidentally inserted in there and that apparently is something he said actually got caught by quality control assuming he even has a department for that and uh it was taken out but somehow made it back in and quality control did not check the proof to come back so yeah sure okay uh, now, here is a one-off mistake where Gooding is giving burn ointment to Eric, hoping to save Eric's arm uh, from the damage inflicted upon him by the creatures who blew up his security house. And later in the book, however, Gooding notices, wait a minute, how's your arm already healed? The ointment isn't that good? The ointment isn't that good? I mean, you just said his arm was already healed. So why would you be questioning whether or not your ointment was any good? What you should be saying is, the ointment isn't that good. Nobody edited this book. Here's another one-off mistake. Eric is driving to Blood Ruth's residence. He says, I'm in a costume, getting around in a truck. And then there's a silent panel. Gooding has me in the middle of nowhere with coordinates. But a good truck is a good truck. Okay, even leaving aside the fact that we do not need a comma here, um, this is in the wrong freaking panel. All right? I'm in a costume getting around in a truck. But a good truck is a good truck. 
thing is to be in the middle of nowhere with coordinates. Yeah, it's... You don't put, but a good truck is a good truck in a scene where he's not using the truck. I... Now here is the next category we're going to go over, and that's Art Slack. Because as much as I praised Cliff Richards for his work on a particular uh, 29 panel sequence of ISOM number two that I thought was exceptional in its storytelling quality. He is not consistently good throughout the book. He is sometimes really, really off of his game. For example, when we look at Club Merc, you will take note of the fact that the entire side of Club Merc is now concrete and devoid of any foliage. Whereas in ISOM number one, it was made up of lots of windows and trees. So what happened? I mean, did he just decide that, you know, okay, those, those trees and those windows were too much of a threat and he concreted up the entire building? Um, did Darren, you know, have all those renovations done overnight? I, I don't, yeah, whatever. Fuck my life. Next, we go over to Gooding's Lair, except we can barely see Gooding's Lair. I mean, it's there off in the distance. This is about as close to, as we get to seeing the entirety of Gooding's Lair. And then when Avery and uh, Mrs. Williard, Sam's wife, fly in on the jet booster robot, we only see a little bit of the compound. <sighs> well, maybe that's actually for the best, because when we actually see the entirety of Bloodroot's compound, we get a combination between a bounce house and a miniature golf castle. What the absolute hell is this? And what are these? Are those like spray cans? What are those even supposed to be? This is, this is just insanely bad. Now, here's a part that's kind of a subtle art slack, and this just has to do with kind of a coloring fail that uh, I would ascribe to Gabe El Taib. Uh, we have Lincoln Eusebio, and it looks like he's putting his seatbelt on, which would make sense because, you know, he's, they're, they're driving towards a concrete barrier, and we don't want him to, uh, to go flying through the windshield now, do we? Uh, so he is uh, gripping the uh, seatbelt and putting it on, right? Except he actually does fly through the windshield. So what the hell happened? Did he, was that him putting his seatbelt on or was that him taking his seatbelt off oh wait look over here hidden in all that blue on blue on blue where we can barely see a fucking thing yes it's the seatbelt yeah so this this was actually supposed to show him taking off his seatbelt as opposed to putting on his seatbelt okay now now we can understand that scene but boy did we have to dig for it amongst all that blue on blue on blue? You would think that, you know, you just have some forethought to realize people need to see the seatbelt to find out, to figure out what's going on. By the way, did you notice that in all of the scenes that I showed you under the category of art slack, there was no dialogue whatsoever? That's because so much of ISOM number two is wasted space. We have, for example, an entire page dedicated to Larry Shungite coming out and stepping into the ring. Now, there's plenty of opportunity here for uh, Terry and Joni, <coughs> the uh, ringside announcers, to wonder what the hell Larry Shungite is doing here and, and kind of talk a little bit about the night before and maybe give us a little bit of a clue as to what, you know, he's doing or, you know, the fact that this is an unscheduled visit, you know, that kind of thing. But no, why would we ever need information on a page? Same thing with Avery getting, going to get his gun. Now, is he taking the gun for defense or is he taking the gun for offense? Is he planning to use it on someone or is he just taking it for protection? Oh, and by the way, where does he plan on going right now? He's about to leave the house and run into Sam's wife and so they're going to go to Goodings. But was he planning to go to Goodings all along? Or was he going to go find Darren and maybe shoot the guy? Um, I don't know. You know, that would have required Eric July to do some actual writing and tell us what's going on in Avery's head. So 
Instead, we're just going to get a whole bunch of panels of nothing other than uh, Avery Silman looking cool and picking up a gun and putting on sunglasses and walking out the door and, you know, whatever. And then, of course, there is the approach to the bounce house, which um, could have been maybe handled by a setting of mood, you know? Maybe there there could have been some some explanation, like, you know, my eyes can't seem to focus on it. It's like it, it seems large and small all at the same time. And and uh, I, I the, the, the cries in the night of all of the – just something to just – take our minds off the fact that we're looking at really shitty art. You know, give us something, but no, that would have required effort. Now we're getting into some of the real meat here. You know, this is just the shit that makes no sense. Oh, let's go into the uh, lead up to the car crash where the car that Lincoln Eusebio is riding in is about to crash. His driver, who it turns out is not on his side, Smithers there, says, You're going to kill us both! And Lincoln says, I have no plans of dying tonight. I'll even give you the ride. And then they're heading towards this concrete barrier, and they smash into it, and Lincoln, who has taken off his seatbelt, is flying through the wind windshield. So he's apparently flying to safety through the windshield, even though that's way more likely to get a normal human being killed. Um... Okay, here's the question. If you're the driver of a car and you're driving at a really high speed toward a concrete barrier and you're afraid you're going to die, have you thought about taking your foot off the accelerator? Maybe. I mean, even if it doesn't stop the car, you can at least slow the car's approach toward the concrete barrier by, you know, refusing to speed up anymore. I mean, you can even take your foot off the accelerator and put it down on the brake. That'll slow the car down even more. In fact, it might slow you down to the point that you never even hit the concrete barrier. Wouldn't that be something? Then, then you might not even get in an accident if you, like, hit the brake. Oh, but wait, someone will say. What if Lincoln Eusebio had his foot down on the accelerator so that, you know, even though the guy had the brake on, it didn't do any good? Okay. First of all, if that was the case, it should have been indicated in the story. We never got any indication that anybody but the driver had access to that foot pedal or was pushing it down. So that's something that needs to be told to us by the writer or the artist, either one or both. Second of all, in most cars, if not all cars, brakes beats acceleration. You will not uh, speed up if you have your foot on the brake while you are accelerating. You will slow down because the brakes work much better than the, uh, than the accelerator does. But even better than that, you would think that Lincoln and the driver are riding in a high-end car, right? Well, it just so happens that one of the mechanisms that now exists in high-end cars, and this is like going all the way back to, I think, 2012 or 2013, is that if you hit the brake, it cuts off the accelerator. So it wouldn't matter if Lincoln had his foot jammed down on the accelerator. The brake would cut the accelerator off. <sighs> so there was no real reason for that car to hit that concrete barrier at such passenger ejecting speeds. That's just, that never, that, that doesn't make any sense. Next, we have some characterization nonsense. Uh, Avery is telling Sam's wife, when I arrived at the security house, the door was open. I walked in, and Sam was nowhere to be found. I was ambushed by two beasts, and they set the building on fire. Now, he says Sam was nowhere to be found, and there's, you know, no indication that Sam's in any danger yet, but nevertheless, she faints. And Gooding says, you knew she would fall out, didn't you? Well, I assumed as much. Sam says she could be a bit dramatic. Really, Sam's wife can be a bit dramatic. She wasn't dramatic at all when she was riding a jet-propelled robot. Now, let me, let me make it clear. When I saw this scene, this scene scared me. I'm like, okay, if I'm getting onto the, to the robot platform, my assumption is that robot is about to sprout roller skates and skate our asses up to the door. 
not fly off on a damn jet pa or on jet boots where it doesn't even have its arm around me. You know, what the hell? I mean, it's got its arm around her, but that still shouldn't really give that much of a feeling of security. If she's a drama queen, like the like uh, Avery says she is, she'd be screaming her damn head off. Hell, it's a miracle he's not screaming his damn head off, unless he's had this ride before and he's come to trust it. But good lord, I mean, that's that's not safe in, in the slightest. And anyone who hasn't been on that ride before is going to be screaming up a fit. Oh, especially a drama queen. So it's like, can you have even like the slightest shred of consistent characterization in this book? Oh, and here's another great part. Hey, you remember the part where uh, Gooding gives Avery a, a card that's going to get him in to see uh, Bloodruth? And then when Avery goes to the gate, instead of looking for a card entry, he just tears up the fucking gate? What is the fucking card for? I mean, I haven't gotten that far yet. Probably on the next couple of pages it's going to show me that. But you would think it would apply here too. Because why would Gooding send him to a place and then tell him, oh yeah, you're going to need to tear, tear the gate up. But here's a card that will get you in on all the other stuff. Oh my god. Oh. And, and you know, one of the things that's really, really sad about this book is how it introduced the character of Gooding and then ruined the character of Gooding. All in the same book. All in the same book. It just it just took from the first third to the second third to do it. <sighs> Why is that? Because when the book introduces Gooding, you look at the stuff that he's got at his disposal. And he's got drones, and he's got a suit that's kind of sort of high tech, but maybe kind of medium tech. I mean, it's got kind of a little bit of Iron Man flavor to it, but it doesn't look as clean as you would see in one of the Marvel books or something. Plus, he's got this robot drone, the, the, the dog, that is based off of current day modern robotics. And when you look especially at his business card and how his packages are as low as $49.99 a month, you start to realize that, you know, Gooding, he seems like a technological genius who doesn't have access to a whole lot of money because, you know, yeah, you can get $50 a month from a bunch of people, but that's, unless you've got like a hell of a lot of clients and those packages go up in price pretty quick, that's not a whole hell of a lot of money. And so it made me think Gooding is kind of like a low rent Tony Stark. He's like a middle class or lower middle class, upper poor kind of Tony Stark. Like what if you were Tony Stark genius but you had to settle for buying kits off of Amazon and, scra and scrounging in the junkyards. What if you had to, to deal with the materials and the technology that was really at hand instead of, you know, inventing all of this, you know, miraculous stuff? Well, all of that gets ruined when Avery and uh, Sam's wife visit Gooding's lair because the lair looks like freaking Adventures Mansion at this point. And he's got like all these view screens and he's got robot drones. And it's like, uh, come on. I, I don't need to see a Tony Stark or, you know, more accurately, if you're looking at Marvel, a Hank Pym with his Ultron robots. I, I don't need that. I already read that. Marvel's been doing that for years. You had a chance to make an interesting, low paid character who was having to create technological marvels out of like refuse. And instead, I, it just seems like the same old, same old. And it's just, it's just freaking sad. I mean, I, I have nothing but sadness from this book at this point. Now, of course, nothing is 100% negative. There were three things that impressed me about ISOM number two. One was this sequence of dialogue. With human DNA, think of it like this. We all have our own unique scripts, but the actors are the same. Now he's talking about... He's, prep, he's preparing Avery for uh, what he's about to impart with regard to this demon that has been discovered. And so Avery, after hearing this, says, and this guy is from a different studio. I have to admit, I laughed at this. I, it was funny, as was Gooding's next response. He's in a completely different industry. This was funny dialogue 
kudos to Eric July for making me laugh in this particular case. Now, one of the other things that impressed me was this little bit of dialogue by Eric July saying, deactivate windshield emergency protections. Okay, uh, why is that important? Well, because earlier in the scene, it turns out that Lincoln Eusebio had upgraded uh, the windshield protections on the car, uh, the, the ability of the car to withstand, bullet, to withstand bullets, and therefore you would expect the same protection on the windshield as well. So he would have to deactivate that windshield protection or else there's no way he's flying through the windshield, which is what he intended later on. So kudos to Eric July on that for anticipating that he would need that bit of dialogue to avoid a technological explanation later on. And then last but not least, here's the big one the, the, of the three things that impressed me. Oh, what do I see? What do I see there? It's Darren's last name. Hallelujah. 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 That's right. Darren Fontano's last name has finally appeared in an ISOM book. I swear to God, I thought it was going to be ISOM number three or even later that we were ever going to see his last name. So there we go, people. Darren Fontano, he finally has a last name in ISOM number two. So on that lighter note, I conclude the Let's Fix ISOM number two segment entitled, eh, screw it. And, and seriously, I mean, at this point, I, I just call the book bad and move on. I, I, I would not recommend this. I would not recommend ISOM number one at this point. At this point, if anybody is interested in the Ripperverse, let them get one of the number one titles from one of the other books. Let them get Alpha Core number one. Let them get Yaira number one. Let them get Gooding number one. And then advise them to come back. And if they really, really want to, they can come back and see in ISOM what, where, where those characters had their first appearances. But honestly, th this, this series just isn't worth it. I mean, I, I would, I, I'm at the point where if it wasn't for number one, OCD, and number two, uh, people like, watching my review video is that I wouldn't even fuck around with ISOM number three at this point. I'm just frustrated to no end that this shitty book was allowed to go to press. I mean, seriously. And what in the hell are all these people seeing in it? I mean, you, you guys have no spines to stand up and say, you know what? This is not the quality we deserve. Okay. Can somebody please tell somebody who is on Eric July's side, which, you know, up until this point, I think that included me after this point, I'm not really sure anymore because if, if all he's going to do is, is throw out this shit into the ether and, and expect his customers to buy it, why, why do we pay him for this? Why? This is not quality material. And it won't be quality material unless he gets a team of people who can actually edit a book and tell him, this doesn't make sense. This is bad art. This is bad writing. This is bad lettering. This is bad coloring. We have, he's got to be able to receive this kind of criticism from people he trusts. And right now, I don't think he trusts anybody. So, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just fucking tired of it, seriously. I, I, I rue the fact that I'm gonna have to, you know, get ISOM number three at some point, because that's just money out of my pocket. I don't need to spend. Seriously. All right. Well, I've got a couple other videos that I'm planning to do on ISOM number two, at least two more videos. Uh, there is uh, one that I'm ready to create, uh, but I haven't started work on that. I did start work on another one, but I had to quit partway through because I realized I need to finish reading ISOM number two before I can cast my final judgment on it. And, um, and who knows, when, I, when I'm reading the final third of ISOM number two, maybe I will find some interesting stuff on there to, to uh, comment on. So right now, right now I am in a doldrums because I am so, so disappointed in ISOM number two. I, I can't give it, it makes ISOM number one look like a work of genius. That, that is how bad ISOM number two is. If you don't believe me, go back and um, if you <laughs> don't, don't bother rewatching this video. I won't ask you to subject yourself to that again. 
But uh, go back and watch my uh, my other videos on ISOM number two and see all the other ways that this book disappoints. And I think you're going to be quite amazed. So I'm Mike Partika. Thank you for watching. Please do subscribe so that uh, we can uh, you can keep track of when I come out with my later ISOM number two videos or any of my other comic or news related videos. I uh, offered up a little tribute to uh, late DC Comics author and writer, uh, author and artist uh, Keith Giffen. Uh, please do check that out. Uh, talk about some of the work from him that I appreciated very much. And, uh, and there are other things that I'll be commenting on as well. So thank you very much. And I'm Mike Partika. Please do subscribe. And I will talk to you later.